So we come then to have a look at Christ's teaching in relation to our relationship with other folk. So this is where we're up to. We've been considering in Matthew chapter 5, verses 21 to 24, we dealt with hatred in the heart and how that is effectively murder, isn't it? It's effectively murder because if you had the option, you might kill someone if you actually happen to hate them. We saw in verses 25 and 26, for the need for humility when in error. It's all about judgment and mercy and about peacemaking. We saw in verses 27 to 32 the issues of adultery in the heart, and we're going to actually pick it up from there in a moment. But then in verses 33 to 37, we have truth in the heart, which is all about keeping your word. And, of course, there's a nexus here, isn't there? Because verses 27 to 32 is about marriage and the marriage vow, the covenant that we make in marriage before our God. I've made two great covenants or promises in my life, the first was the most important. It was when I got baptized. I made a vow to my God to serve him for the rest of my days. But about three or four years later, I stood upon a platform in front of a group of brethren and sisters, and in the presence of God, I made another vow. And that vow was to my beloved wife of nearly 50 years. And both of those vows I will be held to. Both of them. And so this is the context in which we find ourselves here in this section of Matthew chapter 5. We're going to go on and consider verses 38 to 42, the way of non-resistance, and in verses 43 to 48, the standard of perfectness, which is under the heading, the law of love. So there's still a few matters to deal with in relation to the law of the heart. Now, as I said previously, Christ was destroying the accepted teaching of the rabbis of his day. This is why, when he quotes the words of the Old Testament, the law, the Ten Commandments, sometimes he will add, you have also heard. And, of course, he's talking about the teaching of the rabbis. That's particularly the case in this matter of marriage. Fourteen times in this discourse... He says, I say unto you, as I said, 14 is the biblical number for the certainty of spirit announcement and covenant. When you get 14, you double seven, seven's the spirit number, you double it in scripture. We are told in Genesis uh, chapter uh, uh, 41 and verse 32 that when you double something, you make it sure and certain. So note the difference between verse 27 and verse 31. See verse 27 of Matthew 5, Ye have heard that it was said by them of old time, and then comes the quotation of the seventh commandment of the ten, Thou shalt not commit adultery. But have a look at verse 31. It hath been said, Whosoever shall put away his wife, let him give her a writing of divorcement. Now, that's actually a quotation of what the rabbis taught about Deuteronomy 24 and verse 31. It's not what Deuteronomy 24 says. You see, this verse 27, it was by the law of Moses. In verse 31, by whom? Well, the rabbis taught. Whosoever shall put away his wife, let him give her a writing of divorcement. Deuteronomy 24 does not say that. There is no permission given in Deuteronomy 24. It's all about if. You have a protasis and then you have a conclusion. If this happens, if a man puts away his wife, if she goes and marries another, if, 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 okay, it's all about it. And there's actually no sin in the woman at all. It's in a matter of nakedness. A matter of nakedness, do I need to explain that? This is about marriage, a matter of nakedness. not anything to do with her sin. The man doesn't put her away because of what she has done. He puts her away because he doesn't enjoy their relationship, their physical relationship. And he wants to get another woman. That's why. So the law of Deuteronomy 24 has got nothing to do, nothing to do with sin in the woman. And I can prove that to you. I don't have time to do that now, but ask me. I can prove it to you. Okay? So we've got ourselves mixed up on this question like the rabbis got themselves mixed up on this question. We need to see why Christ says what he does, brothers and sisters. Now, there are those who think that I'm entering into territory where angels fear to tread on the question of marriage and divorce. 
But I would be remiss if I did not express to you what I believe Christ taught. I would not be able to live with myself if I did not tell you what I believe he taught. You be the judge whether or not we've got this right. Okay? You be the judge. This was the teaching of Rabbi Hillel. He said a man could, with Moses' authority, put away his wife for every cause. Now notice this, for every cause. So any minor infraction provided a basis for summary dismissal of his wife. Burning a meal or dressing improperly were grounds for divorce under his teaching. This was increasingly the dominant view of the two schools of thought at that time. And there were two distinct schools of thought, but both with the same conclusion. And the conclusion was that you could, under certain circumstances, divorce and remarry. Christ is going to show that that is not what God taught in the Old Testament, and it's not what he approves of. Okay, This is why he says, and I say unto you, it's going to be different than what was taught in his day. Ultimately, one of the disciples of Rabbi Hillel, Rabbi Akiva, taught that a man may divorce his wife even if he has found a prettier woman. Wouldn't that be terrific, brethren, if you could justify that? This, of course, had always been the real motivation behind unwarranted divorce. Always their motivation. They wanted to marry another woman who was more attractive to them than their current wife. So this was the teaching of the day. And everybody accepted it, except Jesus Christ. And we need to understand this. He repudiates the teaching of the rabbis of his day. The rival school of Shammai bitterly opposed the liberal views of Hillel and taught that a man may not divorce his wife except he found in her an unseemly thing, that is, unchastity. Thus, in this school of thought, the only grounds for divorce and remarriage were restricted to sexual impropriety. So is there an accepted clause? This, uh, you know, we've got this phrase in capitals, E, capital E, capital C, because people, of course, have used this. I always ask this question of anybody who argues that there is such a thing as an accepted clause that allows remarriage after divorce. My simple question to them is, show me the teaching either of Christ or of the scripture that gives permission to remarry after divorce while there's a living partner. Zero. Find me. Find me the reference in scripture. It does not exist, brothers and sisters. There is no permission to remarry. So let's have a look at Matthew 5, verse 32. But I say unto you, so this is going to be a very different teaching than the teaching of the day, that whosoever shall put away his wife, then here comes the so-called accepted clause, saving for the cause of fornication, causes her to commit adultery. And whosoever shall marry her that is divorced, committeth adultery. Now, if it's so-called acceptive clause, it's like a parenthesis, isn't it? Like a parenthesis. What if you drop the parenthesis out? Which you can legitimately do, can't you? Let's drop the parenthesis out. It gives you the understanding of what he's saying. Given the teaching of Rabbi Hillel, that if she burnt your dinner, you can get rid of her. No sexual sin, okay? Given that teaching, if the woman is not guilty, of any sexual sin against him. Okay? I say unto you that whosoever shall put away his wife causeth her to commit adultery. So if she hasn't committed it by putting her away, you push her into adultery. You're the culprit here. And whosoever shall marry her that is divorced committeth adultery. We've got four people now. Four people involved in adultery which will keep people, says the Apostle Paul, from the kingdom, unless they repent of it. Unless they say to God, I'm sorry, but I've broken that law. So this is very serious, isn't it? This is an issue that we can't just dismiss. In those times, banishing a wife virtually condemned her to remarriage for mere survival. There were no such things as social security or food stamps, like 35 million Americans are using right now. Okay, There was no such thing as that, brothers and sisters. So for a woman to survive, she had to seek another partner. So four people end up involved in adultery. That's a very serious thing. 
The only escape from culpability for creating multiple adultery is if the wife has already committed it. And you can't be held responsible for pushing her into it. Okay? Nowhere does Christ give permission for remarriage. And in fact, when you go to his teaching in Mark chapter 10, verses 2 to 12, and Luke 16, verse 18, they are clear. There's no question marks. There are no exceptions, brothers and sisters. Remarriage after divorce is wrong. Hence the disciples' view. I want you to have a look at Matthew 19. This is the other chapter where the so-called acceptive clause is supposed to exist. Matthew 19. We know the context well. Look what the disciples thought of Christ's words. Let's read verse 9 first. And I say unto you, so here's the same words as Matthew 5. Whosoever shall put away his wife, and the word except, in fact, is a wrong translation. The, the words in the Greek are me epi. Me is the subjective negation. Epi means upon. You know what he's saying? If you know, subjective, you know that she hasn't committed adultery or sexual sin against you, and you put her away like they did, then you push her into adultery. And you've committed it already because you don't do that unless you've already decided you want to marry another woman. And then the person that marries her gets involved in that as well. Okay? So you get three or four people involved in the one sin. Now, did his disciples think, well, I'm, I thank you very much, Lord, you've given us an exception. You've provided us with an exception that allows us to divorce and remarry. You're very, very generous. Did they think that? Look what verse 10 says. His disciples say unto him, If the case of the man be not uh, be so with his wife, it is not good to marry. In other words, they're saying, we're locked in. If I make a covenant with a woman to marry her, I'm locked in. That's what they're saying. Were they jerks? Did they, did they misunderstand what he said? Were they? Of course not, brothers and sisters. They understood perfectly what he meant. He meant there was no remarriage after divorce. Okay? Simple as that. It goes on to say this, and we've had some ridiculous things said about verse 11. He said unto them, All men cannot receive this saying, save they to whom it is given. So I've heard people say, But if you can't accept that, well, then just go and do your own thing. Really? Look at verse 12. For there are eunuchs. There are some eunuchs which were so born from their mother's womb, men who don't seem to have a need to get married. And there are some eunuchs like Daniel and his three friends that are made eunuchs of men. And there are some who are eunuchs for the kingdom of heaven's sake, so that when they are separated from their wife or husband, they decide that that's it. They're not, while that person's still alive, there's no more marriage. They'll stay, as Paul puts it, unmarried. They're not actually unmarried, but he says you remain like someone who's unmarried. Okay? So there are those who think that I'm courageous in dealing with this matter, brothers and sisters. There are others who think I'm foolish. But I believe we need to understand what Christ taught. It could be the difference between life and death. My counsel to those who have been involved is acknowledge it. If you've been involved, acknowledge it. You don't have to separate your marriage because you've got a new covenant and that's held. You'll be held to that one too. You make an oath, the covenant, God's going to hold you to it, even if it shouldn't have been made. He did that when Israel made their oath to the Gibeonites in Joshua chapter 9. Was, should they have made that covenant to the Gibeonites? Of course not. But once it was made, he held them to it. And even 500 years later, he was bringing judgment upon Israel in the times of David because Saul broke a 500-year-old oath. He will hold you to your covenants, to your oaths, to your vows, brothers and sisters. So if you've broken one of those, acknowledge it. Because our God is faithful and just to forgive those who acknowledge their failure in these matters. He can and will do that. That's my counsel to those who have been involved. So let's come back to something a little bit less controversial. Let's come back and have a look at other matters here. You see, this little box here, oaths and vows must not be broken or discarded. God will hold us to them. Do you think this is what Christ is talking about? Well, look at Matthew 5. 
Look what he says in verse 33. Again, you have heard that it hath been said by them of old time, Thou shalt not forswear thyself, but shall perform unto the Lord thine oaths. That's exactly what he's been talking about. The marriage oath. Okay? So we know, we know what's in his mind. But then in verse 34, he says, I say unto you, swear not at all, neither by heaven, for it is God's throne. So he moves on then to oaths. Now, under the law of Moses, there were three types of oaths in judicial matters. There was the voice of adjuration. It was imposed upon a witness by a priest to extract information about something seen or known. And the Lord Jesus Christ himself had this imposed upon him. In Matthew 26, verse 63, he remained silent to fulfill Isaiah 53. He was like a, like a sheep before its shearers is dumb. So he opened not his mouth until the high priest said, I adjure thee by God. He couldn't remain silent then because God's glory came into the, into the arena. He had to speak then. So an oath of adjuration was to extract from someone the information. There was the oath about lost or damaged property, which we've just been reading about. The oath between the owner and the trustee of property lost or damaged. And you had to accept it. If he said, look, I'm sorry, but it got damaged. You know, a tree fell on it. And, uh, you know, it got damaged. And, and the owner of that property that you'd borrowed had to accept that. And there was compulsory oaths, where a wife was suspected of infidelity. And this oath was imposed on her by the priest. That's the, that's the law of the unfaithful wife, isn't it? And it's there, of course, because Israel, God's wife, was unfaithful to him. So there were three types of oaths under the law of Moses. And he wants to show that really... You don't need to make an oath if you happen to be a truthful person. If when you say something, people by experience of dealing with you know that you mean exactly what you say. No ifs or buts or maybes. If you say it, you mean it and you will do it. That's what we have to become like, brothers and sisters. So what does Yahweh require of us? Well, the answer is given in Micah 6, verse 8, isn't it? But I want you to notice what comes first. In the humanistic world in which we live, which has brushed off onto religious organizations, men will put mercy first, by which they mean compromise of divine principles. That's not what God requires of us. In Micah 6, verse 8, we have these words. What doth Yahweh require of thee? What comes first? To do justly, and to love mercy, and to walk humbly with thy God. And you go through, it's always up front. God does not show mercy until we uphold his righteousness. If we declare him righteous, he shows mercy. That's the basis on which we are forgiven our sins. We acknowledge them, and he will forgive. Okay? And we've got to be the same as him. In other words, what he's saying is, and what Christ is saying in this section is, the primary thing that our God is looking for in us is honesty and integrity. And I am very thankful to my parents for a number of things. I'm thankful that I was born to them because they happened to be Christadelphians. My father, a second generation. My mother came in from outside. First of the Martin family to come in from outside. And, of course, that means that I've got different branches, someone who was in the truth, someone who had come in from outside. And I appreciate what they did for me. Appreciate the fact that my mother and father insisted in our home on honesty. You know, we would do, we'd break windows with cricket balls and things like that. And, of course, I, had, I waited for hours for my father to come home from work thinking I was going to get a thumping for breaking a big glass window with a cricket ball when he'd said to us, don't play with a hard cricket ball near the windows. When he came home, he didn't give me a thrashing because he was told by my mother that I had been in a state of apoplexy for several hours waiting for the thumping. Okay, uh, And that's conscience at work, see? This, this is like an acknowledgement of, of righteousness. You know, that Dad was right. That's the basis on which God forgives. Okay, same principle. So they thumped into us honesty and integrity. 
That was always something that we heard around the kitchen table. Never, ever tell lies. And I find it amazing. I give talks like this on this and other subjects, and I have people coming to me afterwards and saying, but Brother Jim, didn't David tell lies when he came to Nob? Didn't Rahab tell lies? And what they're really saying to me is, shouldn't we as Christadelphians tell lies? Give me a break, brothers and sisters. We must be truthful. There are explanations as to what happened. And David suffered dreadfully because he told lies. And so did the family of Elimelech. Because all of his sons were killed by Doeg the Edomite. And the orders of Saul because he told lies. Christadelphians don't tell lies. And if we do, we don't understand. Micah 6 verse 8. What does Yahweh require of thee? But to do justly. He wants honesty and integrity. He wants truthfulness. And so does our Lord Jesus Christ. Look what he says here in Matthew 5. Deuteronomy 7 verse 9. It's the same thing, isn't it? Know therefore that Yahweh thy God, he is God, the faithful God. Yeah, he never tells lies. Which keepeth covenant and mercy. Notice the order. Okay? There's truthfulness and faithfulness up front. And then mercy. Jeremiah 22 verse 16. Josiah judged the cause of the poor and needy. Was not this to know me, saith Yahweh? So when there was truthfulness and justice and honesty in the reign of Josiah, not like his son Jehoiakim, who was a rotter, that was to know Yahweh. We need to understand what our Lord's teaching. Let me just read down with you to verses 35 to 37. Swear not at all, he says, neither by the earth, for it is his footstool, neither by Jerusalem, for it is the city of the great king. Neither shalt thou swear by thy head, because thou canst not make one hair white or black, but let your communication be yea, yea, nay, nay. Whatsoever is more than these cometh of evil. Do you remember those words in Matthew 23 where he talked about casuistry? What they used to do in those days is that when you went down to the market, you had all of these people on stalls selling bags of whatever. Let's say you come to the man selling potatoes. He brings out a bag. Now, in that bag, the best potatoes are on the top, so when you look in, they look pretty good. The ones at the bottom are rotten. And he hands you this bag and says, These I swear by the gold of the temple. Now, that's not good enough. I'm going to swear by something greater than the gold of the temple, you see. And they step up to get you to believe. He says, don't you dare do that. You're bringing God into this. The temple, that's where he belongs. Okay, don't you dare do that. You need to come to the point when you say this is the best bag of potatoes you've ever bought in your life. Every single potato in that bag is perfect. In other words, truthfulness. So that person goes home and opens up the bag and says, he told the truth. So next time they come and you say this is this bag has got some, you know, that are not all that good, they know that you're telling the truth. Let your yea be yea and your nay be nay. That's what he's talking about, brothers and sisters. Here we go. The next one. The next thing is the way of non-resistance. Verse 38. Ye have heard that it hath been said, and this is a quotation, isn't it, from the Old Testament, an eye for an eye and a tooth for a tooth. Now, if you actually look at that passage where that's drawn from, it's not about vengeance. It's simply about restoration. Simply about restoration, not vengeance. We want to get vengeance, don't we? Someone knocks out a tooth, we want to knock out one of their teeth. Not about that. But then he says this in verse 39, But I say unto you, that ye resist not evil. But whosoever shall smite thee on thy right cheek, turn to him the other also. And if any man will sue thee at the law, and take away thy coat, let him have thy cloak also. And whosoever shall compel thee to go a mile, go with him too. Give to him that asketh thee, and from him that would borrow of thee, turn not thou away. See, what we have here are four illustrations of the way of non-resistance. The first one is personal injury or physical violence. The second one is submission to harsh exactions. The third one is submission to the, to the powers that be, because, of course, in those days, like, like the man who carried the cross of Christ, remember? 
And he was just standing in, in, the, in the group. And the Roman centurion said, hey, you, you mean me? Yeah, I mean you. Pick it up and carry it for him. They could actually compel you to do that. And you had no choice. You had to do it. So all of these things have got to do with compulsion, aren't they? It's about compulsion. But the fourth one is not. It's about liberality in giving. And that's the highest ideal, isn't it? You know, we don't read this in the Gospel accounts. We read it in Acts chapter 20, verse 35, a teaching of Christ that's not in the Gospel records. Paul says, Remember the words of the Lord Jesus, how he said, It is more blessed to give than to receive. The problem with that is that nobody believes it. Isn't it? We're not born to believe that. When I was a baby, I only thought of one thing, filling my belly with mother's milk, and I would squawk until I got it. That's how we're born, brothers and sisters. It's all about me. Give me. And unless the truth takes hold of you and changes your perspective, then that's the way you stay. And we're living in a world that's, what do they call it? The me generation. Yeah, because it's all about me. That's how we're born. We've got to get to the other end of that scale, where you believe that the very thing that can make you happy, and that's what that word blessed means, to be happy, it is more more blessed, it will make you happier to give than to receive. Now, I've got a grandson at home, just turned four. He was up at five o'clock in the morning to open his presents uh, on his birthday, you know. That boy, ultimately, has got to learn. He's going to learn from his grandmother something that she knows and understands and practices. That her happiness doesn't reside in her being given things. Her happiness resides in her giving. Giving of herself as much as she can. And you know, she's one of the happiest ladies on the planet because she has learned to give. And that's where true happiness comes. And in marriage, it's true. Don't look for your own interests. Look for the interests of your partner in life. And the more you put into them, the happier you are going to be in that relationship. That's the rule. It's a fundamental rule. So when someone comes along and asks to borrow your RV, brother, which you've just purchased at, you know, $45,000 or whatever it might be, you're going to be perfectly happy to let them use your RV. Are you not? Now, why are you laughing? You can come and borrow my caravan, as we call RVs in Australia. You can borrow my caravan any time you like. It was manufactured in 1980, and it looks like me. It's ragged. It's perfectly functional. My wife and I use it all the time. But if you come to Australia, you're welcome to use it any time you like. That's why I don't have a new RV. You got my point? You got my drift? Now, this is a challenge, isn't it? It's a real challenge. We're living in an age where everything's, you know, brand spanking new. I've just got my new Cadillac. You know, would you let would you let your next door neighbour drive your Cadillac? Of course you would have. So think about this. Our Lord Jesus Christ didn't even have a place to lay his head, brothers and sisters. But if you asked him for a covering like Legion did, guess what he did? He took off one of his garments and gave it to him. What he had, he gave it to him. Brother Roberts, you remember, was often asked, he was the editor of the Christadelphia, he was often asked for, for, for assistance. He didn't have any money. The organisation didn't have any money. So one brother asked him, you know, oh, I just, I'm desperate for help. All he had was his watch. Took it off and gave it to him. Go down to the pawn shop. That's all he had. Okay. That's the kind of liberality, generosity, that Christ is talking about here. So we need to think about that, don't we? You are going to be much happier if you give than if you receive. We believe that? We really believe that? Well, he's asking us to believe it, brothers and sisters, and that's a matter of faith. Verse 38. You have heard that it hath been said, by God, through Moses, an eye for an eye and a tooth for tooth. Cited, of course, Exodus 21, 24. Leviticus 24, 20, Deuteronomy 19, verse 21. Now, the law prescribed compensation, not retaliation. Restitution. 
not revenge. Then he says this. This is what I want you to focus on now. Verse 39. But I say unto you that ye resist not evil, but whosoever shall smite thee on thy right cheek, turn to him the other one. Now this word smite means to smite in the face with the palm of the hand, not the fist, the palm of the hand, or to box the ear. The only other occurrence of this word is in Matthew 26, 67, where they are doing exactly that to our Lord Jesus Christ. I was slapping him in the face. And he turned the other cheek. But you think about this. There's the palm of my hand. I'm a right-handed person. Okay? How would I slap you on your right cheek? Because your right cheek is on the other side. Am I going to do this? Or am I going to do this? The latter. I'm going to use the back of my hand, aren't I? Now, if you slap someone with the back of your hand, what are you doing? You're showing utter contempt for them, aren't you? Utter contempt. It's about an insult. Anybody insult you? Anyone ever insulted you? We're not talking here necessarily about fisticuffs, are we? This is about the treatment we often get from people. They insult us. And it hurts, doesn't it? It hurts your pride. Yeah. So what do you do? Do you respond? Do you insult them back? No. You just accept it. as being part of the way that God's going to extract from you your natural reaction, which is to respond in kind. Okay? That's what this is telling us, brothers and sisters. So why do you do this? What would motivate someone to do this? Love. Love must be the motive for non-resistance. It is not stoical submission. You know, someone, right, here I am. Hit me on the right cheek and I'll turn the left. It's not stoical resistance to pain and suffering. It's submission. It's submission to this evil for one reason. One simple reason, to seek to overcome the evil. Think about what happens in the mind of the man or of the person that has insulted you or tried to strike you in some form. Think about what's happening in their mind. Brother Sergeant says this, The Christ-like man suffers the blow so that perchance he may win the giver of the blow. And it may be, save a soul from death. It is then that love covers a multitude of sins. In other words, if you don't respond in kind, that person thinks, hmm, I wouldn't have done that. You know, if, that had, if I'd been in his position, I would have punched him. I wouldn't have done what he did. So he goes away and thinks, I wonder what motivated him to do that. There's got to be some higher force in this fellow's life, doesn't there? Maybe I should look into this. Maybe that person will one, one day come to the truth because of you. You've done that out of love. Love to save him from himself. So you're prepared to put yourself down to save him from himself. Get it? That's the principle, brothers and sisters. It's very hard. Wait till someone insults you next time and see how you feel. All right? You want to say something nasty back at them. You want to get back at them. Resist it. Say something pleasant. Say something very pleasant to them. Because they will go away and think about that. Because you're not acting like them. That's the simple lesson here. And why should we be like that, brothers and sisters? Well, because Christ was like that. And perhaps even more importantly, that's what his father is like. So that's why at the end of Matthew 5, he turns to his father. And he deals with what we call here the standard of perfectness. In Matthew chapter 5, verses 43 to 48. So let's read this passage. Ye have heard that it hath been said, Thou shalt love thy neighbour and hate thine enemy. Now, love thy neighbour, of course, is cited from Leviticus 19, verse 18. If you go back and have a look at the context, which we're not going to do in that particular case, you will see that the situation requires people to act abnormally, right, to love your neighbour. 
But it's hate thine enemy that I want to have a look at. Now you see this verse underlined here, passage underlined, Deuteronomy 23, verses 3 to 6. Because you see, the first part of this, thou shalt love thy neighbor, comes straight from the scripture. The second part comes from the teaching of the rabbis. This is how the rabbis interpreted passages like Deuteronomy 23. So come back to Deuteronomy 23. Now we know what this is about. I'm going to read it from verse 3. An Ammonite or a Moabite shall not enter into the congregation of Yahweh, even to their tenth generation, which really means never. They shall not enter into the congregation of Yahweh forever. Well, we know that that didn't come to pass, did it? Ruth was a Moabitess, wasn't she? Yeah, so Ruth came into the, into the faith because she had the faith of Abraham. So it, you know, it wasn't something that was exclusive. It depended on you, the individual. And God gives the reason as to why they were to come in, because if they retained this spirit, they weren't worthy to come into Israel. He says in verse 4, Because they met you not with bread and with water in the way when you came forth out of Egypt, and because they hired against thee Balaam, the son of Beor of Pethor of Mesopotamia, to curse thee. Nevertheless, Yahweh thy God would not hearken unto Balaam, but he, he turned the curse into a blessing unto thee, because thy God loved thee. Thou shalt not seek their peace nor their prosperity all thy days forever. And that's where the rabbis stopped. So they said, you know, God is telling us we've got to hate our enemy, based on Deuteronomy 23. The next verse in their scroll, the next sentence says this. Look at verse 7. Thou shalt not abhor an Edomite. Really? If you're going to hate anybody, You'd hate Edomites, wouldn't you? Thou shalt not abhor an Edomite, for he is thy brother. Really? And thou shalt not abhor an Egyptian, because thou wast a stranger in his land. Now, the rabbis didn't read that, did they? Well, what God is saying is, love your enemies. Right? There were reasons why Moabites and Ammonites were kept out, because they meant they did not meet Israel with the succor that they needed in the wilderness. And if they retain that kind of attitude, they don't, they don't come into the ecclesia. But if you're like a Ruth who succored Naomi, that's a different matter. Okay? They missed that. They missed that principle. And they said, you've got to hate your enemy. Well, God says, no, no, no. Don't abhor the Edomite or the Egyptian. You've got to love your enemy. So this is where this is coming from. He's going to actually attack again rabbinical teaching. So come back to Matthew 5. But here it is again. Verse 44. But I say unto you, love your enemies. So this is quite diverse from the rabbis. Bless them that curse you. Do good to them that hate you. And pray for them which despitefully use you and persecute you. So What's this word love here? Well, it's the word agapeo. Now, we all know the word agape, don't we? We're familiar with agape. It's the sacrificial love. That's, it's the love of the will, not of the emotions. Filio is the love of the emotions. This is the love of the will. It means a profound respect or reverence based upon knowledge and manifested by self-denial. That's what this word means. Its expression testifies to God manifestation because it's exactly what God does he sends his rain and his sunshine upon the unjust as well as the just it's like a form of love isn't it <laughs> loving his enemies so to speak goes on to say in verse 45 that ye may be the children of your father which is in heaven so if you don't operate like this you can't be his children see that's what he's saying if you don't get this right you're not God's children for he maketh his son to rise on the evil and on the good and sendeth rain on the just and on the unjust. Now this word may be is the Greek word gnomai. It means to begin to be. Right? To begin to be. And we all make a slow start on this, brothers and sisters. It is very, very difficult, from my experience, to love your enemies. And you know the best way to love your enemies? Seek their salvation. Pray for them. Pray that God will work in their lives. Do what you can 
to influence them in the things of the truth. Try and save them. That's what God is doing for you and me. Even when we was we were his enemies, says Paul. When we were enemies, he gave his son for the redemption of the human race. Okay? So that's the principle involved here. That ye may be the children, Uios, a son, a male child is the heir. He makes, he sends. They're deliberate acts of God. Deliberate acts of love provide the two basic necessities of life. Light and water. Light represents the truth. Water represents the word where you get the truth from. Okay? There's no discrimination in the extension of God's love. But we need to be cautious. We have this silly nonsense in the religious world of today. You know, the books by Yancey and others. About God's unconditional love. And I hear it in the brotherhood. God's love is unconditional, we hear. Rubbish. God's love is not unconditional, brothers and sisters. Just one verse, Romans 15, verse 10. Uh, sorry, uh, John 15, verse 10. So come to John 15 and verse 10. In John 15, verse 10, we read this. I'm going to read from verse 9. As the Father hath loved me, so have I loved you. Continue ye in my love. So how do you continue in Christ's love? Verse 10. If ye keep my commandments, ye shall abide in my love. Let me ask you a question. What if you don't keep his commandments? Do you still abide in his love? That would make nonsense of that statement, wouldn't it? Absolute nonsense. If ye keep my commandments, ye shall abide in my love. Even as I have kept my Father's commandments and abide in his love. What would have happened if Christ had disobeyed his Father? Would his Father have said, oh, don't worry, son. We can deal with this. We'll get over this. No, he would have said, the redemption of the human race is gone. Finished. Wouldn't he? See what he's saying? God's love is not unconditional. And that's what Paul says in Romans one twenty. He says, even in the creation, God has given evidence that he exists. And yet men turn to their evils. And that's why when the judgments come to this earth, brothers and sisters, and two-thirds of this world's population are wiped out because God will take no less from the whole of humanity than he will take from his own people. Two-thirds, four billion people, gone. It'll be perfectly just because every one of them, every single day, gets up to the rising sun and to a full table of the fruits of the field. And that is the evidence he exists. And he's going to hold them accountable to that. His love is not unconditional. But we want to be like him, don't we? But there is an inferior love and there's a perfect love. So come back to Matthew 5. Verse 46. For if ye love them which love you, what reward have ye? Do not even the tax gatherers the same. So when you've got men, you've got inferior, imperfect, usually selfish love. It's about what you can get out of it. The publicans, of course, are the tax gatherers. And the tax gatherers were a closed, insular society. They were mere traders or usurers in love. You, know, you put your money in the bank, what do you expect? Interest. So you show love, what do you expect if, if you're human? Return of love. You want to get some interest back, don't you? Mere traitors. God's love is self-denying. It's unnatural to the flesh. So that's why he says, be ye perfect, even as your Father in heaven is perfect. Now, can you be perfect, brothers and sisters? No, of course. We don't, we don't mean perfect in the, in the modern sense of, of that word, Perfect meaning that you're absolutely perfect and therefore obedient in every respect to God. I can't be. You can't be. We fail. We sin. We need forgiveness, don't we? He's not talking about that kind of perfection. What he's talking about is singleness of motivation. Is God mixed up? Of course he's not. 
Does he sort of change his mind tomorrow and say, well, I brought the sun up yesterday, but I think I might not bring it up today? Do you think he does that? Is he mixed up in his priorities? Or is he single? Can you be single in purpose in life? Well, of course you can. You can have a single motivation, can't you? A direction that's not mixed up with all the nonsense that we're born with. Set your course. That's what it's talking about. Now, that perfection is attainable by you and me. Simply wants direction and purpose in life. That's why I said to Israel, Deuteronomy 18, verse 13, Thou shalt be perfect with Yahweh thy God. There's an expectation that we will be single in our motivation. Perfection, says Brother Sergeant, is unity within oneself. Get that? He's quite right. The perfection being spoken of here is unity within oneself. So you're not divided. You know, one foot in the world and one foot in the truth. This is about having a singleness of purpose in life. Peace is unity with others. If you get people that have got the same direction in life, guess what you get in your ecclesia? Peace. Isn't that not true? Christ now has come the full circle in returning to the theme of verses 3 to 12. It was his character portrayed before his disciples, and he was the complete manifestation of the Father. Have I been so long with you, Philip, and you have not seen the Father? This was the one who was full of grace and truth. He was the Word made flesh, brothers and sisters. Now, before we start the next session, let me give you the bridge between Matthew 5 and 6. We've just had that reading that took us into chapter 6. So what is the link between the law of love that we've just considered and the challenge of worship, the challenges of worship which follow in chapter 6? Well, Brother Sargent's going to help us. This is what he says. The line of thought has been brought to a climax in which it is shown that all, that is, these principles we've been considering, have their motive in love. And love has its source in God. By an orderly progression in thought, the next section deals with the disciples' communion with the God from whom alone he can learn the love which he is to show. Another wonderful, pristine statement of the connection between what we've just been considering and what is now before us, the secret and the manifest.